think we'll go ahead and start. Good morning, everyone. Hi, good morning. My name is Shalika Matthews. I'm an associate clinical psychologist at the Michael Care Center, and my co-presenter for the day is Dr. Shauna Millo. Morning, everyone. I'm a school psychologist at Michael Care. All right, so this is the second series, well, the second session in the Helping Kids Thrive series that we're having. It's a four-part series. I recognize some of the names from last week. Thank you for returning. Uh, what we're going to start with today is just a recap of last week. And if you have any feedback and are a returning member, you can just tell us how the past week has gone in terms of implementing the strategies we talked about last week or, you know, the homework resource sheet that you were given. Sure. So to just quickly recap last week, we had talked. So the overall um, goal of the series is to talk about some strategies we can put into place um, to really help kids during this pandemic and all the changes that we're all going through. Um, last week, we talked about the fundamentals of the importance of spending quality time with kids and how that really helps to build a strong relationship, which enables um, children to feel secure and to um, you know, uh, follow along with what parents say, be more compliant. Um, and we also talked about putting into place clear expectations around um, learning at home, which is <laughs> what the majority of, well, all of the kids will be doing now, as well as putting certain routines into place, um, just so everything is a little bit more predictable. Uh, if anyone has any feedback on how things went or any questions that they may have had, um, I'll just give you a little time maybe to, to share that now, or um, you can always type into the chat and we'll be monitoring the chat as we go along. So I'm just going to open it up. So anybody, is there anyone who wants to share what have hap may have happened last week from the homework? Anyone wants to type into the chat? Okay, we won't spend too much time. Um, we'll just head into the uh, session for today, which is on fostering independence and Shilika will be leading that. But I'll just encourage you to kind of type into the chat as we go along, if you have any comments. Thank you. All right, morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who are new to the session and to the series rather, we want it to be as interactive as possible, which is why we're asking for feedback, because the point of it is really for us to help you as individualized as we can. So the more you share, the more we're able to speak directly to the challenges you're facing. So if you're not comfortable or you don't have a mic, you can always type in the chat and Dr. Miller is going to be monitoring it throughout while I'm presenting and we'll get to it. We'll have a discussion section about what we're talking about today, as well as whatever challenges you're having in relation to last week or just in general, right? So just talk as much as you can, right? Because we want to hear from you. That's why we're here. Um, okay, so today we're going to look at fostering independence in children. And we chose to go this route as one of the things we're focusing on in our series because we recognize that in these uncertain times as well as in the distance learning paradigm, children are required to be more independent and to self-manage themselves and require a little bit more confidence. I'm sure most persons have been in a meeting or been in this type of forum on Zoom before or on another platform. And it's a little bit daunting to feel like you're talking into space. So it requires a little bit more confidence in yourself. It requires a little bit more management of your behaviors. Because usually when we're in a room with persons, we naturally adjust because we're in that physical space. And it's a little bit different when we're at home, but we still have to maintain that sense of management of our own actions. So that's why we decided to go this road. And the aim is to really provide strategies that can help you to build your child's confidence, promote more personal responsibility, and support the development of their self-management skills. So in thinking about independence, parents 
that's the goal really it's to raise self-sufficient kids who essentially don't need us our own but want us our own right so to do that parents really have to build their confidence teach self-help skills instill in them a, a way to you know the capacity to make decisions independently and allow for natural consequences and provide opportunities for them to learn in a safe environment because children who are independent have high levels of self-esteem they more readily take credit for their actions whether good or bad they are better able to make decisions about what they want they're more willing to try new things they have more belief in themselves and they're better able to manage stress and failure and that is paramount in what we're going through right now so in developing this type of skill which is independence, we chose to focus on confidence, personal responsibility, and self-management. So while these are each individual things, the underlying concepts of them overlap to some extent, as well as the strategies that we use to develop these skills will overlap to some extent. So in terms of confidence, how we're looking at it is the belief in yourself, as well as the belief in your ability to accomplish your goals and, and complete tasks. Personal responsibility is taking ownership for your actions, as well as initiating actions that initiating actions that are in line with the expectations of you or the responsibilities you have or commitments you've made. And self-management is just your ability to self-regulate and manage yourself in various situations that are sometimes comfortable and sometimes uncomfortable. Now, how we chose to approach the strategy implementation is thinking of it like a coach. So as parents, we really want to strike the balance between supporting our kids adequately and not overparenting, right? So one of the best ways that I came across looking at it is like as a coach. So we've all watched at least one sporting event where a coach is involved. I have faith that we've all been, we've all seen a football game on TV. We all know the general understanding of what a coach is. So a coach is never in the game with their players, but they're always there for their players. They're on the sidelines, providing guidance, providing instruction, providing a, a, a space where they can have a safe environment to try new things, a safe environment to fail, a safe environment to succeed, as well as supervising activities, especially when things are new and unfamiliar, to ensure that things go according to plan or don't go too off the rails, right? And if you look at it, that's essentially what parents do, right? We're not living our lives, our kids' lives for them, but we're providing all of this. So essentially, we want you to look at these skill developments like you're coaching your kids in the development of these skills. So coaching confidence, right? And these are some of the factors that really promote the development of confidence that I'm gonna go through. And they're all intertwined. So as I talk about them, I'll reference what different things on the list at different times, just so that you can really see how interrelated they are. Now, establishing yourself as your child's refuge. That has to do with the safety components and providing a safe environment. Children perform best when they understand that they're loved, no matter what. If they fail, if they succeed, they're always loved and they always have value. So it's providing something we call unconditional positive regard. And for those of you who were here last week, we mentioned something along the lines of promoting, always having positive interactions with your children. And this is part of it. So they need to know that they can run to you and cry that they failed, or they can run to you and celebrate that they did well encouragement and we spoke about this last week in terms of how to encourage we want to be action specific and not trait oriented and all that means is that you're saying things like you know i love the effort you made when you studied for this test i i recognize that you know you saw sean was sad so you tried to make him feel better and i'm proud of you for that as opposed to saying you're so kind you're so smart because what that is doing is tying their actions which are positive to who they are as a person. And sometimes when that has a consequence in terms of when bad things happen or when you do something bad, you tie that to yourself as a person. So you're a bad person instead of you doing a bad thing. And we want to practice 
children recognizing that they're the sum of everything, not just one particular thing. Okay, so providing guidance but releasing control and supporting learning are closely related. So the providing guidance and supporting learning has to do with instruction. So you're giving a framework for kids to navigate situations and you're giving them enough allowance for them to learn things on their own but a little direction to know how to go somewhere, right? And the releasing control has to do with you as a parent, managing your own stuff, as we'll say, right? So it's your anxieties when you're nervous about them trying something new, because you don't, we don't want our kids to fail and we don't want them to get hurt. But, you know, life is a harsh teacher sometimes and they're gonna get hurt. And we have to allow that and we have to do that with a calm body and a relaxed body. So when we talk about um, emotions next week, we're gonna talk some more about that. But what it is, is that you're saying positive things and you're also projecting it. So you can say, yeah, you're gonna do a good job and your face looks like, mm, and you look like you're dying inside because your kid is going to recognize that she's saying this, but she don't really mean it. I feel the energy, I feel that something's off. Kids are very intuitive. So they'll feel when you're not okay and you're not settled and they'll adopt that too and they won't be settled. So if you have to fake it, you know, fake it. But they have to know that you're confident in them and you feel it completely so that they feel it completely, especially kids who are much younger and are trying things for the first time and they don't have a fully solid base of confidence yet. It's your job to be calm enough so that they can develop it. And it's very hard because we've all seen kids, even kids that we don't have, we've seen kids that we, and you're just worried, like, are they, are they going to be okay? But more often than not, you're operating in a space where kids are safe. So it's never going to be anything where their life is in danger. But as scrutiny isn't the worst of the world, you know, in the grand sphere of things. So just allow it to happen sometimes because we want to allow for natural consequences in terms of developing independence. Kids need to see how things go and that sometimes things don't go according to plan. So they need to know that actions have consequences and part of them learning that is to allow for natural consequences. We also want to provide opportunities early and often. So this is very, it's very often when kids are younger that they'll go, I want to help and I want to do this. And parents always complain that by the time they get to a teenager, you, know, you don't want help in nothing, right? But that's just the way how it goes. Kids are very helpful when they're younger and you want to encourage that. So even if they can't do what they're asking to do, you want to provide them with another way to help so that you're fostering that level of initiative. And I know that some of these things are things that you always do, but the the goal is to really start doing everything with intentionality because sometimes we're not in, we're not consistent enough and sometimes confidence comes for some kids very easily and other kids have a lot of difficulty with it so when we're more intentional in terms of goal development and attribute development they're better able to develop these skills that are so critical to being fully functioning adjusted adults right so the last one on the list is reinforcing your child's understanding of their power. And that's the most important one to me because quite often they're persons who struggle in life as adults because they don't realize their own power, right? They don't realize how much control they have over their own lives, especially in a time like right now when fundamentally there are lots of things we cannot control. It's important to recognize that you still do have power. Your actions still have an impact. So when we wear a mask, we're choosing to protect ourselves, we're choosing to protect others. And in a time where we still have to quarantine or still have to stay inside, this is one of the things we choose to do to effect change. It's some, and it's fundamental in terms of everything when your child says no because they're uncomfortable, this is what they're exercising, their own power. When they say yes, even when they're scared because they understand that, you know, I can do this even though it's a little bit uncomfortable that's exercising their power when they raise their hand in class because they don't understand something. It's them understanding that my actions can affect change and change my space and my situation for the better. And that's as little as raising your hand in class or as much as becoming president or becoming a prime minister and changing the world. 
So we're shifting to obedience and personal responsibility. And why we're talking about personal responsibility in relation to obedience is because children often, they, they develop obedience first, right? So they follow what you say and what you ask of them before they're able to initiate actions on their own and take ownership for tasks. So children who are responsible uh, take credit for their own actions. As I mentioned earlier, they're dependable. They're, they keep their words. And especially as kids get older, parents really want their children to be dependable. So when you ask them to do something, you know they're going to follow through and you don't have to worry about it, especially older siblings. And when you ask them to help out with their younger siblings, you want to know that you can trust them and you can trust them because they're responsible. So we have to nurture that development in many ways. Number one on the list is modeling desirable behaviors. And anyone who's ever done a workshop, a parent workshop before, has heard somebody say, you have to model behaviors, right? And it, it may be a tad statement, but it's so true because your kids see what you do way more than they hear what you do. And seeing what you do is more powerful because you telling them things can sell night nagging sometimes and kids tune that out. But if they're constantly seeing you do things and seeing you do positive things, desirable behaviors, they will emulate you, right? So one of the things on the list is assigned tasks. So chores, for instance, right? If you don't like to do chores, right? I want us to own this part. So if you don't like to do chores and you grumble a little bit when you have to do it, you do it anyway because you know it's life and you have to do it. But if you grumble through it or you grumble at the beginning of it and your kids observe that over time, they're going to associate chores as something undesirable, something that should not be done or something that's taxing. And there's no way you're going to get them to love it unless they instinctively love it or get them to do it gracefully if you grumble through it. So all of the little things that we do sometimes that we don't pay attention to ends up ingrained into our kids. So modeling desired behaviors. Um, so if they have chores to do on Saturday morning, they need to see you get up on Saturday morning and you know tackle your tasks to do those types of things. In terms of things as like coping skills, they need to see you, how you handle failure, how you handle stress, how you handle life essentially for them. To, are you a responsible person? Are you doing the things you need to do? And once they see you doing that, they'll emulate it. Communicate with your tasks. I'm gonna also relate this back to chores, right? Because as I was going through the presentation and talking about it and trying to be practical with it, I realized that we don't always communicate the importance of things because no one likes to do busy work, they like to feel productive. And sometimes kids will say things like, I'm watching TV right now. And what that's really communicating is, I value my time and I'm placing my time on watching TV because I want to do this and this is important to me. But you know, taking out trash is not. And what you have to communicate is why taking out the trash has value. You know, why it's important, why it's them being productive and not just you trying to give them stuff to do. In the sphere of you know saying that it's a family and a family is a team and we all have to work together to accomplish our goals. And we're going to talk about being goal directed a little bit later. But that type of communication is important in terms of kids understanding why you're asking them to do stuff. And we've done this to ourselves as a society, really. We've, we as a generation of being tired of people just telling us what to do and wanting to ask questions and be more vocal have raised kids that are more vocal. So the consequence of that is that we have to communicate better. We have to communicate more and we have to communicate early. So instead of backtracking and having your kids ask you why, What's good is to practice a communication pattern when you tell them why, right? As you're asking them to do stuff. You know, you're starting to get chores now because it's important that X, Y, or Z. Uh, being flexible. No, if you're like me, you like things done in a certain way by a certain time. But that's not always best for a collaborative approach. So sometimes you have to plan ahead so that you can be flexible in terms of chores, allow your kid the whole morning or the whole afternoon or the whole day to do stuff so that you don't have to be running back at them because it needs to be done at 11 and you set it at 10.30. So they don't have time to initiate on their own. 
And when they don't have time to initiate on their own, you're reinforcing obedience and not reinforcing personal responsibility. And that's what we want. So you want to allow them the room to initiate the actions on their own and allow for greater independence. Things don't have to do exactly how you like them do, done if the outcome is what you want. So the clothes are folded and it look neat, but it's not quite how you fold it, it's not in order how you fold it, and that's fine because you're not the one doing it, All right? So just, a lot, just this part is part of the releasing some of the constraints you have in terms of how you like stuff done and allowing your kids to develop their own individuality and their own ways of doing things as long as it's up to a certain standard, of course. Now, one of the ways to reinforce responsibility without coming across as nagging is to have visual reminders. One example is like a chore chart. So you'll see on the left side, on the left side, yes, there are a list of tasks and you can interchange it. You will be all be getting a resource sheet for with a copy of a chore chart. It doesn't look like that. If you don't like the ones we give you, you can create your own. You can look online to see what designs you like and download those because there are some free ones. There are lots of free ones, actually. Um, I suggest you type in free because some of the paid ones are very cute and you might like those more. So just type in free so that you only see the ones that are free. Um, so you can change out all the different activities and you have days of the week. You, you can specify it to so some things are every day, some things are in the morning, some things are in the afternoon, just so that you don't have to say it, but your child can see the responsibilities that you and he or her have agreed upon, right? In that communication part, it's very important that it's a collaborative effort. So you're not just dictating all the time, you're discussing to say, okay, I, I need some help around the house. You know, what are the things that you think that you can do to help? And they can give an option and you can give an option. For persons with multiple kids, they get a little break because you can balance out certain tasks among the different kids and they can rotate it. And it can be rotated for, by week or by day, things like that. Um, that way everyone's doing a little to contribute and you're teaching them a collaborative approach to life, which they're going to need because as they start school, they're doing group work. When they go to college, they're doing group work. When they're at an organization, they're working in teams. And it's very important that everyone understands how to work together in life. So this is a great way to start that skill development. And remember, if you guys have any questions so far or any comments on anything so far, drop them in the chat and we'll get to them after this, right? So we're moving on to self-management, which is the last on the three prong list that we're looking at today. Now, children who are able to adequately manage themselves and their behaviors have often benefited from the development of core skills like self-confidence and personal responsibility. So essentially, as I was saying at the beginning, everything that we're talking about today feeds into each other. So kids who are confident and responsibly, responsible. Um, I saw your raise hand. Um, we're just gonna finish up and then we'll talk. We'll do the talking section. We have allocated at least like a half an hour to that. So we're, there's gonna be more than enough time for everyone to, for the discussion to really take place. All right, so yes. So kids benefit from self-confidence and personal responsibility to develop their self-management skills. And several factors which make good self-managers are their self-efficate, they have self-control, they're persistent, and they have a mastery orientation. So self-efficacy really is just confidence. It's a belief in yourself and your ability to accomplish tasks, right? So to build these skills, we want to do all of the coaching confidence strategies that we've discussed. We want to develop responsibility, but we also want to make sure that there are opportunities to build this confidence. And one of the good ways to do that, to do that is to develop a goal-oriented approach within the home. So quite often we all have daily goals, but we don't use that language. So we don't say things like, you know, what are our goals for today? And we accomplished our goals to reinforce that. So when kids hear that terminology being used, they're a little bit more apprehensive about it. So it's an easy way to do that. You know, they have their goals for the day, which is doing your homework, uh, doing your chores, 
you know, helping out Arrow with your brother or your sister, just whatever it is on this. We all do to-do lists so kids can have their own little to-do list. And it can be really cute. You know, you can have a cartridge paper or a whiteboard or a blackboard and they write it down and they get to take it off or rub it off. Just make it really fun and interactive. I love taking things off a to-do list. I feel accomplished when I do it. And quite often kids feel that way too. Because as we talked about last week, routine and structure is important and having goals for your day helps to give you that. It helps to give you a direction on where to go. And in life, having goals like, you know, you're buying a house by then, you're buying a car by then, you're saving towards this helps you to figure out how to structure your life, how to structure your path. And achieving your goals builds your confidence because you accumulate resources and you accumulate reference points where you can say that was hard but I did it so when you're faced with something else that's hard you can refer back to something that you did before and you're like yeah all right I did that and that was hard I can do this thing that's hard no self-control and we all use the term self-control so we kind of we know what it is it's managing your emotions and your behaviors it's delaying gratification it's inhibiting negative responses so when you're driving your car and somebody so a taxi man come up beside you swipe you or you know almost touch your car and you want to drive him down and say something you just you breathe and you just you know you live your life in a positive way right so it's all of those little things and for kids it's you know they want that chocolate but you told them no so it's managing that you know i can't get what i want but i'm not gonna act a fool i'm not gonna start crying in the supermarket because they understand that sometimes no happens, right? So it's essential they understand that life doesn't always go your way. And sometimes life goes your way and you need to learn how to act right in specific situations. And to build these skills and to do this rather, kids need to learn how to cope. How to cope when something really good happens. Because that's what, you know, being a good sportsman is when you win or when you get the promotion and rubbing, rubbing it in anybody's face and you're being graceful in the situation or when something bad happens, you're able to manage that and deal with your sadness or your anger because you didn't get what you wanted and not lash out that person. So when kids have step, strong coping skills, they're able to do that. You will be getting a list of coping skill examples that you can work with your kids on or that you can use because it spans the range of journaling, drawing, doing yoga, exercising, watching TV, you know, going on walks, deep breathing, a range of things that you can use to cope and to help you navigate stressful situations. Uh, you want to also prepare your child for what they're getting into. This is and this happens institutionally. It's why, you know, you prep for a big event at work. It's why when kids have their prize giving, there's a whole rehearsal the week before at school for them to know they have to sit in this chair and they have to walk up this way. It's for you to be prepared at what you're getting into. And for life in general, we can't always prepare, but when we can, it's a, it's a blessing. And parents are there to be the ones to prepare you. So you already know what a supermarket looks like. So the first time you take your child to the supermarket, when they're of age, you know, you say, you know, we're going in. And especially if you don't have enough money to buy things and you know your kids like to take up things, you know, you can say, okay, so I'm only getting essentials today. I'm running in. So we're only going to pick up this. You cannot have an extra candy. You cannot have this. Or you can only have one thing. So pick that one thing so that just that they're prepared or they're going to the doctor's office and it's going to be away. You know, some doctor's offices take forever. So you bring the coloring books with you, you bring the reading books with you and you say, you know, it's going to be a while. But you have the phone and you have your books. So I just want you to sit down and if you're getting bored, tell me and I'll try to help you, that kind of thing. Just preparing them for situations. Because when we're prepared, we don't get caught off guard and we don't have lapses in how well we can cope with that situation. Persistence. All right. So persistence has to do with maintaining focus and concentration when distractions or interruptions or frustrations happen, right? So it's getting hit with a setback and keep going and overcoming and keep trying. So to do this, practice is very, very important. Practice makes perfect. We say it all the time. It's true. 
as tired as it sounds, it's true. So when you practice, you get better at doing something and you keep going, so you end up mastering something eventually. But in terms of persistence, what they leave out sometimes is that clear guidance is important. If you keep trying things and you only know two ways to try it and it not work, there's no way you're staying persistent on this. Because the two dege dege ways you know to make it work, not work. So you need some guidance, you need somebody to say, try it this way. And that's what we do as parents, is that, you know, you shift them in another direction, like, you know, them not see how it's going, so you just, you, you give a little nudge. So that guidance helps limit frustration and increase persistence. It also helps them to know that you are they, their safe refuge and they can come to you when they need help. And it reinforces that while you are persistent, you don't have to do things on your own and you can ask for help. You want to, once again, model how to cope with failure and model perseverance. So you in your life, when you're struggling, if you even be like, Ugh, and they hear you, you have to keep going because they saw the, uh, so them have to see the perse perseverance after and the persistence after so that you're modeling that behavior and providing opportunities that are challenging but not overwhelming. So they have to work for it, but they can't be stressed by it. And the final thing that we're going to talk about today is mastery orientation. So mastery orientation is really being driven by a desire to increase your own learning and a desire to increase your own skill. It's moving from strength to strength. So when you watch kids that have found their interest and that they found something they like, they just want to do it. So kids who love to read are always reading. Kids who love football, them always on the football field by themselves with them friends, it don't matter. Kids who, you know, are in karate and want to move from a white belt to a black belt. Whatever their thing is, when you find your thing, you want to do it and you want to get better at it. So it's very important for the kid, children to have a broad base of exposure so that they can find what's meaningful to them and nurture that sense of always doing it better. And suppose it's football, it can transfer to learning because that discipline that you learn in one aspect of your life can often transfer to other areas of life if, when you see the point of it. So school, many kids don't like school, but they see the point of it, so they'll work hard at it, right? You also want to normalize failure. Uh, it should be more like meh, it happened whatever and then you just keep going and persevering but a lot of times failure hits us hard and kids who are less resilient get hit harder by it kids with kids with less confidence get hit harder by it so that's why confidence is such a strong foundation as well as responsibility because kids who are responsible also have more sense of you know making decisions and initiating things so they start thinking in a problem solving manner so when they're hit with failure, they're thinking, you know, all right, this is my mess up, this is my mistake, what can happen next? How can I fix it? How can I move on? And you want to focus on the value of learning with mastery orientation. All right, so that was the presentation. I know someone raised their hand, all right? Uh, let me try and find the chat. Uh, the floor is open for discussion, for comments, for savings. So the person who raised their hand can definitely go ahead right now. Does anyone have any questions or comments or anything they wanted to add into the chat at this time? So the person that raised their hand is Galaxy Tab A. Um, so if you could just tell us your name and then just say, you know, what you wanted to say. It might have been an accident. I'm not sure. <laughs> Anyone have any thoughts on fostering independence? What are or any thoughts on your own children and how um, they've been able to um, show independence or any struggles that you're having with independence at home. I know it can be a challenge. Some children are naturally responsible. <laughs> I'm not even sure how. 
And then other children definitely need a lot more scaffolding in learning to be independent, especially when it comes to either schoolwork or chores. Um, it can be really hard, especially for children who with um, who've been diagnosed with ADHD. It's definitely the, that's probably the most challenging um, case of children teaching those children to be very, very to kind of get things done to show initiative. Um, I don't know if anybody has any experience or any challenges with their own children in terms of how to get kids to do what they need to do <laughs> without harassing and nagging all the time. So if there's, I mean, if there's no questions or comments, um, I think Shalika is going to talk briefly about like some of the resources that you'll be getting in the, from the presentation today. Um, and next week we should be talking about um, in managing emotions, how to manage emotions for ourselves and how to help our children be more resilient when they're, you know, similar to today in terms of facing setbacks, but a little bit more focused on how to deal with feeling worried and stressed and, um, with more withdrawn. So those kinds of more serious emotional challenges, uh, how we can help our children really cope well. Okay, uh, so Antoinette was brought up something in the chat. She said, you know, she feels like harassing and nagging is the only way to get it conveyed and action when, and this is for a child with ADHD. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I know it feels that way quite often, especially because when you need things done and you've asked, it feels like, okay, I, ask and I have to ask again and I have to ask again. Um, but like I was saying earlier, it really is setting up a framework in which you don't have to ask, which are constant like reminders, visual reminders that don't involve you talking. Because sometimes kids with ADHD have difficulty, you know, really attending, as you would know, but also just with organization and with remembering some of the things you've told them. And quite often when we say things, kids are not listening to us. So they didn't even hear it the first two times, is it? Really, because they're doing their own thing. And it's really important that when you ask for something, you make sure that they're looking at you and attending to you and actually focusing on what you're saying. So you're not just talking into the air, really. But also that they're reminders. So if you can put like the little chore chart helps one because it's repetitive and systematic so if every monday is trash day then every single money monday sorry <laughs> i said money i don't know why every single monday is trash day so after a while and it takes a while i'm not gonna sugarcoat it to say go happen in week two <laughs> i mean the recorder might i mean the recorder might go missing i'm, I'm just you know um, but, you know, the little charts can help. And if it's systematic, then he gets into the habit of doing it. So it becomes second nature, kind of like how we drive or how we do certain things that we've done, how we walk. We don't even think about it so much. So when things are a habit, you want to develop his responsibility into a habit. So have like clear, fixed things and reminders or checklists. I don't have a checklist for you guys, but I'll get a checklist just to add it to the list of resources. So you can do your own checklist so that he can, okay, so this is school and these are all the things he needs to have for school. So before he leaves, he can take off so that he can monitor it himself. So you don't have to talk because the truth is, okay, kids don't like to hear their parents talk too much. They tune out. They start tuning out. It's like, you're bothering me. I don't want to hear it. I just want to do my own thing. So if you can build in strategies where they don't have to hear you talk, but they're reminded nonetheless, then that would be most beneficial. So checklists and visual reminders. And then that communication part is key. So ask him, you know, how come I always ask you to do stuff and you're not doing it so that you can get from his perspective, you know, why he's not doing it. If he's just forgetting or, you know, he didn't really hear you the first time so that you don't assume yeah, what, yeah. where he's coming from and you know exactly where he's coming from. One of the, um, one strategy that can help for older kids can help is that communication piece. So one of the things that we can do as parents with our kids who are a little bit older 
um, is to have a discussion around the problem and problem solve together. So it's like, you know, I really need your room to be neat or I really need um, this particular chore done. No, my issue is that when I say it, <laughs> I have to say it five times and that becomes a problem for both of us. So it's trying to work together. How can we come up with a system that, that we get this thing done, but you don't feel like you're being that. So, I mean, having a discussion can really help sometimes brainstorm together, whatever I did this, if they say, Oh, I just need to set an alarm or if I, you know, if I get, um, whatever, whatever. So it's a kind of talking together and trying to communicate and figure out how can we resolve this problem together? This is what I need <laughs> and this is what's happening and it's not working. So how can we get it done? The other thing I think Shalika had talked about earlier, the, a very difficult thing is allowing for natural consequences sometimes, depending on what the thing is. There's sometimes when if we just allow whatever would happen, for example, if a child is late for school consistently or, or you have to harass harass to get them on time you can just allow them to be late and face the natural consequence of that you know what i mean so there are certain things that we can allow it to play out even though it will be very stressful because we know that it might have you know getting late they might get detentions etc but we can sort of just allow it to take place and that can be a way for children to learn responsibility because once they see, because if we're constantly rescuing them or, you know, forcing them to sort of get with it, they don't see exactly the consequences of not following through. So sometimes if they see the consequences of not following through with the things that they need to do, it teaches them to say, okay, I need to figure out how to be better prepared. If I don't wash my clothes and there is no clothes <laughs> um, available after two weeks, they will learn how to figure out how to get my, my laundry done. Indeed. Um, I, things like washing the dishes too. Listen, if it's their job to wash the dish, I'm going to wash my cup and whatever they left in there will stay. Right? Because sometimes you just have to allow them to opportunity to follow through as well. So say he's in charge of washing dishes, but you come in the kitchen and you don't like seeing and you wash it anyway. They don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. I, I will admit that if I'm by myself and I know I have to do things, I'm very efficient. If I know somebody else is going to do it, I may not do it. <laughs> so sometimes kids need to know that no one's going to do it for them. They have to do it for themselves. And once they understand that, they'll, the initiating part of it starts to come in. Any other questions? Anything from you? Anything you want us taught specifically? If I pronounce that incorrectly, I apologize, truly. All right, so in terms of the resources you're gonna have, I'm, I mentioned them briefly throughout. So it's, I'm giving you some two exact, two activities rather on growth mindset. And what that really is aimed it to do is target the self-management section of it and really having kids be responsible for, well, changing their mindset in how they approach tasks, how they approach failure and how they action plan after a failure. And personally, I think it's good for adults as well if you don't have that mindset necessarily or if it takes you a little bit what of a while to get to the problem solving part, it can help you in because our growth mindset is for everyone, not just for kids. The activities are just very child friendly to help them really understand it in a visual way and breaks it down into steps. So it has things like, you know, what happened? You know, how can I do better next time? What can I change? Those types of things are on it. And you can, they're printable and you can reuse them for, so especially, it would be good when kids have a really difficult task. They can pull out the, the reference sheet and just work through it. It helps them to problem solve and move through step by step. You'll also get a listing of coping skills. And like I said, sometimes our coping skills are not what works for our kids. So modeling is good, but if what you do doesn't work for them, then it doesn't make much sense for them. So you want to provide them access to different things that they can use to help them feel better in situations. And I, I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier, but also 
help in the communication, helping them to explore how they're feeling. Uh, someone said it to me once and I hadn't really registered that upset is not an emotion and it's really just a label that can mean 50 million things. So it's very important that kids know what they feel outside of upset. You know, what is the actual emotion so that you can actually deal with that emotion and process through why they felt that way, you know, what led to that and if it's how they thought about a situation or if they need to address a situation with somebody. And a lot of these skills just help them to be much more self-efficient adults and much more self-efficient in a interactive basis because persons who are confident, who are self-managers, who are independent and responsible, just have better friends. They have more friends. They are socially engaging. They're able to navigate situations and life better. And that's why we really feel that these are core skills that should be intentionally focused on. Um, resources. There's also a sheet in terms of activities or and reference information that you're going to get. Uh, we asked you to do for next week, but we know the week may be hectic. But, you know, just try and go through it to read what, what's on it, as well as, you know, the different activities we're asking you to. You don't have to do it now. You can pull it back two, two weeks from now, a month from now, and go through to see, you know, where you are, if there's any one thing you want to work on. Because we don't expect you to work on all of the things we're asking you to do at one time, it's a lot. And life is not stopping for you to, you know, action plan these things. But if you just pick one thing at a time, you'll get there eventually. And it's an ongoing process, even though when kids get to be adults, you're still parents and you're still supporting and encouraging certain types of skill development and recognizing, you know, where their weaknesses are so that you can continue to support them. And if there are no more comments, I think we're gonna wrap it up right here. So thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.